Um, I'm talking about buoyancy, and I, I think it's good to connect with people where they're at. I don't know what you think about when you think about buoyancy, but it takes me immediately to swimming. And I swim like a brick, I'll be honest with you. I've got size 12 feet, and if you, you know how you're meant to float in the water like a mushroom to keep yourself safe? You know, if I do that, my feet sink, they pull me under. And we often think about buoyancy as the kind of thing, swimming aids, that would help a child to stay above the water so they get confident in the water. I have the privilege of travelling down to Lou in Cornwall many times, and I've worked with the RNLI down there, and they say, OK, when someone's in the water and you are trying to save them, the first thing you need to do is to give them some buoyancy so they're lifted up out of the water just a little bit so that you can then come and save them. Otherwise, they will probably pull you under. And why am I talking about that right at the beginning of this session? Well, Board is a planning platform. I won't talk too much about the, the products and the company. We'll come to that at the end if we have time. But when I talk about planning, I want you to translate it into your own language. If, it's, if you use SNOP, Sales and Operations Planning, if you use IBP, Integrated Business Planning, or just doing some end-to-end -end supply chain planning, just let me use the terminology of planning and you translate that to what that means for you. Because from my point of view, actually when we start to think about our world of planning, many of us are drowning. We're either drowning in data, or we're drowning in change, or we're drowning in some way or other overwhelmed by what we need to do. Many companies, some of you are probably like this, some people have, post-COVID, have jumped into a world full of Excel spreadsheets, trying to join things together, and just we're still living in that place of trying to keep Excel spreadsheets pulled together. Others have disconnected their planning process and they've got a demand planning tool and a supply planning tool, but to join them together, to be able to make them change, then they need some level of buoyancy. And buoyancy will come and bring confidence into the planning process. So let me just start as an example, a current example rather than post-COVID. We just think about what's going on in you know, ships coming through the Red Sea. That, that, that rerouting of what's going on now impacts our plan. If we've got products coming from the Far East and they used to come through the Red Sea, now they're taking longer by going round Africa. That means we've got to change our plan in the short term. What does it affect in terms of what's already on the way? But there are other knock-on effects that get triggered from that point of view. So, OK, if it's now going all the way round, an extra million dollars worth of fuel to go that extra route with the extra weeks, prices are going up per container. That means that maybe for some of our products, sourcing them from the Far East is not so cost effective. We need to do some right shoring review that just says, OK, do we want to source from the Far East or should we source from somewhere closer to market that gives us less inventory under risk and gives us the flexibility and capability to do that. So then we're starting to look at sourcing and then we think about the transition of where we are now to where we want to get to. So, OK, if we want to move from sourcing from Indonesia, as some of our customers are doing, to sourcing from Turkey, there's that transition and that plan. But then we've got to take the medium-term view, that, or medium to long-term view, that then says, OK, what will the rate of containers be in the medium term? Because we don't want to hard-bake uh, financial decisions into the way we source and supply. And so we need a bigger picture. It's not just a volume picture. And, and one of the elements of, of, of the capability of the board planning platform is not just to plan in volume, or not just to cash up, as some people would do, which would be volume times a value, that would start to give us stability in our plan, but volume times cost price, volume times selling price, to give us the trade-off of profitability. Let me ask you one of my favourite questions right at the beginning, and I'll tease you with it through the rest of my presentation, which is this. Is your plan profitable? I'll come back to that later. Because one of the things is often we have black holes in our view. There are bits of data we don't know, and we have to plan with assumptions. And some of those assumptions lead us to make assumptions internally about our, our capability and our capability to drive those things. And that drives potential... Uh, internal uncertainty. Supply chain leaders have, have, have wanted to think about different ways of driving the planning conundrum, driving the planning ecosystem, wanting to think about a right mix, a right mix by supply, a right mix by factory, a right mix by looking downstream to be able to compare the supply plan with the demand plan to ensure that availability is underwritten. 
And that then drives us to a place where we can drive resilience in the supply chain and maintain ag agility in the decisions. You can see on here, many supply chain leaders are, are still wrestling with the dimensions of thinking about how can we think about a new model? How can we think about driving greater efficiency? So Gigaset, who's a customer of ours, they're a manufacturer of handsets and those kind of things. One of the things they journeyed through when there were silicon chip shortages, they said, okay, we know what we can produce in terms of capacity, but we now need to look downstream into our supply chain to look at our service level agreements with some of our customers to see what service level agreements and penalty clauses might be constrained or triggered by non-delivery. So it's not just about looking at material availability and production capacity and finished goods inventory. It's looking right down into the demand chain to say, OK, what do we put at risk if we do not deliver this kind of capability? And that then enables scenarios to be pulled through, so different scenarios to be considered. And those scenarios might be an alternative sourcing approach. One of the things that we find executives say <coughs> is supply chain professionals are saying that they... Less than 20%, this is a survey that was done um, by Gartner a couple of years ago, well, last year, um, but very much saying that they struggled to be able to drive better business performance in the supply chain. They weren't confident around the decisions that were being made because there were a whole set of assumptions that may be in one planning scenario but not in the supply chain planning scenario as we try and connect our tactical plans to our strategic plans. Let me give you an example. Maybe a cust you're thinking about growing business into the Latin American market. $50 million worth of business with $5 million worth of profit. Sounds like a simple thing, top-down calculation that would help to drive those kind of elements. But many, many planning tools, you'd have to build that from a bottom-up point of view, as opposed to start with a top-down view and some assumptions and you build out the detail. So we don't have the need for elements like phantom skews and that ability to develop. Well, what if and maybe? And the impact then drives us to a place of being able to make better profitable decisions. And those profitable decisions will be about operating supply chains more effectively, more dynamically, to keep buoyancy and confidence in the planning cycle and the planning process. Just let me pause here and just think about whatever your planning cycle is. When you have planning review, let's say you're running on a monthly cycle. When you have your planning and review, how much of your time do you spend in your planning and review looking backwards? Many meetings I, I've been in, I've been part of, I've heard of, 80% of the time is spent looking backwards trying to explain why the plan was wrong, as opposed to trying to have continuous improvement that says, OK, what's the three things that we can learn from last month's cycle that we can apply and improve and drive that continuous improvement into our planning cycles? So then when three months, six months, nine months out, actually your planning con conundrums are unrecognisable. And so how do we help to drive buoyancy through thinking about this? Well, it's, it's using intelligence in the planning process, whether that be in demand planning or in manufacturing planning or procurement planning. Many, many supply chains are limited in some way by some key constraint, some bottleneck somewhere, sometimes in manufacturing, but quite often in key material supply. Now, wouldn't that be useful to know about that in your plan so that actually when you press the button, you knew your plan was not only possible, but feasible, and ultimately profitable. And that requires that we are pulling through uh, other considerations like risk. How do you model risk in your planning process? Often risk is modelled through safety stock, and safety stock can be a calculation of forecast stability or instability, depending on what kind of products you're working with. But how often do you review your safety stock calculations? You know, often they're part of a three-month, six-month annual review cycle, if they get reviewed at all. And consequently, um, we run with a little bit more fat. I, I must confess I could probably do with a little bit more exercise than I do. But so could our supply chains. Our supply chains could do with having a bit of a, a trim mechanism, where we just say, OK, how can we plan differently to ensure that we've got flexibility? If you work on a FIFO basis, first in, first out, then the more inventory you've got, the less responsive you're going to be. And the alternative to that is to prioritise and say, OK, well, we can prioritise the in inventory differently, but then you'll get slow-moving stock, and then you'll have write-off and other elements. So having visibility into your plan over the short, medium, and long term allows you to buoyant, drive buoyancy and fresh thinking from this point of view. And how we would do that from the point of view of playing with the different departments 
is I want to encourage people to have not only a feasible plan, it's achievable, you can do it, but also a profitable plan. Some companies will have an IBP process in finance and only in finance. And they will do the calculations to say, okay, is this plan profitable? But they couldn't tell you whether it was feasible. Other companies would have an IBP process maybe only in supply chain. And they can tell you whether it's possible, whether the capacity is there, but they can't tell you whether it's profitable. And actually, best practice would say, pull, pull your teams together, the key components, the key players, so that you're pulling together the demand plan. What, not, not just forecasting, but your demand plan. So what the forecast says and how the forecast gets consumed to help to drive better availability and better inventory performance. Then looking into the supply chain to drive better capacity and better network planning. I'll throw questions out like this, and I guess I reflect in some way. I have the privilege of teaching on this stuff at university on a regular basis. And so, please, I will have some homework for you at the end of the day. Not that I'm going to mark, but I think if you've sat through 45 minutes with me, then I want you to get some value out of the presentation. So there'll be a slide right at the end with a set of questions you can take home, and you can just go and ask of your business or your role or whatever you're doing because hopefully that will have given you some value. So even if we don't start a conversation today, you've gone away and done some thinking, you've gone away and, and, and done some benchmarking and testing. So I will come to some questions at the end, but part of the thing that I will throw out all the way through is some questions that you could ask. So here's another one. Who owns the value of your inventory in your business? I'm not talking about how much it costs to stock it. I'm not talking about how much it costs to move it or even to produce it. I'm talking about the value of your inventory. Is it something you consciously plan or is it something that comes as a consequence of other measures? Because one of the things that you will find in the planning conundrums that I'm talking about today is people want to be able to pull different levers at different times. You know, sustainability has come up the agenda and now people are saying, I want to be able to pull the lever of sustainability. And then, you know, as shipping costs have gone up more recently, we're saying, well, okay, we want to look at miles travelled. And does your planning in ecosystem enable you to pull all the levers you want to pull, not just one at a time, not just one dimension, but maybe two or three levers at a time? Is this profitable and is it green? And so as we step into some new measures, as we push forward and think in different ways, we've got the ability to drive those kinds of things. So... Who owns the value of your inventory? And it might be that it's about customer service and batch size and, and the way you buy from your suppliers. But it will often just be a function of those measures, as opposed to something that you plan and control. And the finance team are always asking us, well, what about risk? What about uncertainty? How do we handle uncertainty? Some of that will be structural. Um, in terms of the way our supply chains are designed. It will be built into capacity or zero hours contracts to allow you to flex demand, and allow you to flex supply, but also maybe sometimes even to flex demand from the point of view of driving different demand consumptions. But is your risk profile reflected in your supply plan? If there is uncertainty, is that reflected? If you've got a new customer, a new product, um, new product launch, new regional kickoff, and it's 50% likely to kick off in three months' time, how is that represented in your operational plan? It'll be in the finance plan because it'll be top-line numbers. But how is that represented in the detail of your supply chain plan? And the assumptions that you have in your different planning environments, how do they get cross-pollinated so that when you get to a planning approval process, your supply chain director is not saying, well, is the contract with this particular customer in there? So pulling that all together so there's visibility and confidence. Because all of these elements need to collaborate. They need to be able to collaborate because there will be different assumptions, there'll be different validations. Many companies are still, and I don't know where you'd be on this spectrum, have a think about it. They'd run with a, a, a monthly cycle of SNOP or IBP, and the first week would be assembling the data and then producing your demand plan. The second week might be producing your supply plan in response to the demand plan. The third plot would then be the demand supply review, and then the fourth, cycle, the fourth week of the cycle would be signed off and approval. Well, okay, what happens if through that process somebody says, okay, we're going to close a new deal with, with a new customer, Marks & Spencer, they're coming on board now, um, and other retailers could come on board. I'm just picking a, a brand we all recognise there. But, you know, what happens when they sign up and that comes on board? How do we go through that loop again? We have to wait for the next cycle. 
And so having the ability, first of all, to have your data ready from moment one. So not build your data, cleanse your data. The data has been built and cleansed already at the kickoff of the beginning of your monthly cycle, assuming that's the way you want to run. And then you can run your demand scenario alongside your supply plan. Because as demand is being worked upon, that scenario is visible to the supply planners. And I'll come to a visualization of this. But the need to collaborate backwards and forwards and to be able to share assumptions, look at op opportunities, and drive extended collaboration across the business drives towards concurrent planning. So that ability to plan in parallel rather than only in sequence. And expanded visibility is something that people are asking for. Well, they want to be able to see a little further, be able to respond a little more proactively. Let me go back to a key supplier who's got a key constraint. I mean, silicon chips would have been an example we've been through recently, but that there could be other issues in terms of capability and capacity. Would you not want visibility of some of those bottlenecks and supply constraints into your plan? I wear glasses, so if you, if you come, you can see that, um, but, but, but if you come into my, into my vision here, I can't see you. You're, you're out of my field of view. And actually, if I had bigger glasses, and I've got pretty big glasses at the moment, but if I had even bigger glasses, then my field of view would be better. I would be more responsive and less surprised by you walking into my field of view. Isn't that exactly true about supply chain planning? If we could just enlarge our visibility, I'm not talking about connecting everything in. I'm talking about placing visibility into our supply chain planning that enables us to be able to go, OK, there's an unusual number. I'm not pulling it into my demand plan or I'm not pulling it into my supply plan, but I am aware of it. Let's take an example. Let's say you've got two or three retail customers who are major parts of, of consumption of certain products. And you want to pull into your planning process visibility of their forecasts for your products. Now, you may not want to integrate it in because you say, well, their forecasts are not very good. We can forecast better than they can. Well, that may be true. But wouldn't you like to know what numbers are in their system? You've got a forecast of 5,000 for next month in, in your system. They've got a forecast for 10,000 in their system. You get visibility of that. What does that immediately drive you to? Why? Why is there such a big difference? You go and knock on their door. You speak to their account manager. He says, oh, we've got a promotion on your product next month. Oh, didn't know about that. We probably Now, the 10,000 number might not be right. It might only be 7,000, but having visibility of those kind of things will drive towards better planning decisions. Expanded visibility will give you greater buoyancy. Ellen MacArthur, when she talked about sailing across the southern, southern oceans on her own, she said one of the key things was when you got to the top of a wave in a boat where it might be swamped by the size of the waves, you were then looking ahead to the next wave and aligning yourself to the next wave so that you weren't sideswiped. Same thing happens in planning. Let's make sure we can see just a little bit further so that we're able to react in different ways to drive a more intelligent plan and a more profitable plan. The kind of value drivers that come from thinking... On the left-hand side, we've got localised planning, thinking about, for example, siloed thinking. Um, a focus in terms of performance, historically driven. How much time do we spend looking backwards in terms of our demand history? And then thinking about um, the dimensions that we consider. Do we look at different alternatives? Um, ma many companies would single source on a whole range of materials, but actually they want to, you want to dual source on certain things. You want to look at the trade-offs of flexibility and variability versus costs. And so to drive towards greater intelligent planning, thinking about whether that plan is both profitable and achievable, but also starting to pull in the different scenarios that help to drive holistic decisions. If we think about our planning cycle, typically senior executives are involved in approving a planning process, uh, approving the final numbers. They'll be looking at the high level numbers and saying, we agree with that. But whatever your planning team is who's generating those numbers, what you'd like the planning team is to recommend to the executives, this is what we would recommend. So maybe you've got three scenarios, scenario A, scenario B, scenario C, where you considered maybe, uh, let's, let's think about uh, Ukraine. Cost of sunflower oil has gone up dramatically all around the world as a consequence of what's going on in, in the Ukraine. Well, OK, are you going to pass on to your customers that significant increase in the, in the raw materials? Well, scenario one might be, say, you're not going to pass it on at all, but then because your competitors are, you're probably going to pick up some market share. 
The other extreme of that completely would be to say, well, OK, let's pass it all on. Well, if we pass it all on, we'll probably lose the market share and then there might be a middle way. Now, to be able to create your volume plan and then turn that into a value plan and understand the profitability of that, because that's about selling price and revenue and therefore the profitability of the plan, you want to be able to encourage your planning team to say, OK, here's three scenarios. Which one would you recommend to the executive team as the most likely plan that we should go forward with all the assumptions sitting underneath it? So you do the work outside the meeting. And I don't know how long your planning meetings are. If they're four, six, eight hours long, they're far too long. I'm just being honest with you. I've been in six-hour SNOP meetings. It's painful. But actually, we need to do the work outside the meeting so that the decision can be made in the meeting. So the, the planning team take the decision, make the recommend, so that the executive team can make that decision. If they need to run some overtime, if they need to go to an alternative supply, they can approve that and you move forward. And so we move forward from, for example, being forecast driven and, and, and allowing pull technologies to come through and to empower enriched scenarios where we're looking at all those kinds of things. So in achieving supply chain buoyancy, we want to move from complexity driving towards simplicity and simplicity will be that we automate processes. Now, it's not that we automate everything, it's not black box, I'm not talking about that, but we at least automate the assembly of the data. We pull the data together in agreed ways, and those, those, that data then gives us a view of our business. So we can align the technology to drive improved, improved process, change management, and move forward. How do we achieve that? Well, we achieve that by firstly finding intelligence uh, using intelligence to understand the ecosystem, the data we've got, to automate where we can, but to generate exceptions where we need to. And that continual improvement cycle would say, let's pick on the, let's pick on the areas where we can improve and let's improve them on the next cycle, we'll improve a little more. So that intelligence drives us into our planning thinking where we're starting to look at rules and allocations if they are relevant. We're able to consider different scenarios. Um, and we're able to govern that from in, in terms of governance from the supply chain planning point of view. This then enables dashboards to give us insights into our supply chain planning and enable the users to look at the data in something that is meaningful for them. So if we think about a planning horizon, think how far out are you looking? If your sales and operations planning piece is 18 to 24 months out, where are you focusing your attention? It's not that you're not, I'm saying, where is your attention focused? If I think about the crosshairs in my glasses, I don't have crosshairs in my glasses, but if I did, <laughs> where would they be focused? Is that six months out? Is that eight months out? Is that, what is it? And then the, the ouch question comes, is that where you are focused longer than your longest lead time? Because if you are only focusing on four to six months and you have some components that are seven months out, you, you will rarely catch up. You will catch up because of luck, because you've missed the forecast, but you will rarely catch up because of those elements. So being able to tell these kinds of stories then enables those insights to come to life and for the, the planning team and the planning process to learn. And that then enables us to be more collaborative with thinking about this and driving from that point of view. So it's not just about a process. It's not just about a technology. It's about financialising your plan so that they drive value. It's about um, using that value and not being driven by budgets. I was only with a, com a company last week we were talking to, and they were talking about how they have to reflect and align themselves to budgets. So if they're ahead of budget, they're pulling their forecast back. If they're behind budget, they're pushing things up. And then when they get to the end of the budget year, everything changes. I hope that's not you. But if it is, let's talk. Let me give you an example of where we're doing this kind of thing. Lamb Weston's a customer of ours. They're one of the largest potato processors and manufacturers in the world. They grow potatoes, lots of different kinds of potatoes. You can see there, I'm not going to go through all the, the numbers behind that. But I just want to unpack as we journey through a story around Lamb Weston about what they're achieving. Because if you think about sourcing potatoes, the first thing they've got to do is to find a farm to grow the potatoes. So they've got to set up a contract with a farmer and say, we want you to grow potatoes for us. And, that will, that, and, and there will be X number of acres going to be planted under potatoes. 
So you're building out long-term capacity. But then you need to decide which potatoes are going to be planted. And apparently, our, our, our preferences around potatoes are changing. We're moving more towards healthy things like sweet potatoes rather than the normal potatoes. Some of us prefer wedgies rather than mash and all those kinds of things. So, and that requires a different type of potato. And so the first thing is acres under planting. Then what is going to be planted? But then once the seed potatoes have been planted, then the next question is, okay, what's the yield going to be like? And the yield is being impacted by global warming. The imp is it being impacted by localised weather conditions? And so even though the, the potatoes have been planted, then as they start to be harvested, a further level of iteration comes into the plan that drives these kind of thinking. So their challenge was that they wanted to pull all their information together and to be able to have an organisation that was going to help them to be more effective and not just focus on forecasting. Initially, they were just focused on demand requirements and couldn't connect that into their planning cycle. And so when they wanted to look at new market opportunities... They couldn't tell whether it was possible or not. They wanted an integrated plan that enabled them to do this, giving them insights into their planning cycles and their planning processes. And this was their dream, that they would generate a demand forecast, look, creating a baseline, then overlying with promotional activities and driving that through exception. That would then drive into a DRP, distribution requirements plan, that would look at the, the network requirements plan of frozen and dry products but that would then look up further upstream to raw material requirements and look at inventory holding costs. Because when, 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 when the harvest is good, what are you going to do with the extra potatoes? Where do you want to put them? Where's the most profitable place to put them? Is that into dried powder or is that into frozen products, hash browns? Where do you want to put them? Because that then becomes a financial perspective. As soon as you put it into a, a particular product of a particular type, you're suddenly making financial assumptions. And those, those, uh, uh, they wanted to then be able to drive to what-if scenarios. And one of their main competitors in the Australian market um, had a problem in their factory, and so some of the, the customers started coming to them. And, and they had to look at, OK, how do we not only review this opportunity, but ensure supply to our existing customers. We can't just go yes to this new opportunity and then compromise our service level agreements to McDonald's and other people that they supply to. So they wanted that ability to join this all together. And so they started with an application review saying, where have we got the disconnect? How are we going to drive it? How are we going to define the objectives of our IBP? And then how are we going to start reporting on this to enable us to have a supply chain control tower from end to end? And here's the lessons that they learned. The lessons that they learned were, be agile. Don't wait until it's all perfectly defined. Get started. Because actually it's far easier to steer a juggernaut or to steer an oil tanker on the move. If you want to move an oil tanker in port, you need tugs and you need to move it around very slowly and very carefully. But if you've got a business and it's on the move, just small adjustments allow you to... So they said, let's go agile. But let's also keep our peripheral vision wide so that we're aware of things that we're missing. Let's capture those kinds of things and build them into our, into our, our culture, our approach. And then let's start to drive the benefit and value we're getting out of our planning process and drive those returns on investment back into the planning cycle and the planning process itself. And I'm not going to go. If you want to see more of this, please come and have a look on our stand. But just an example of our SNOP process and the collaborative capability. Whether it's demand planning that you need or distribution requirements planning, production planning, or, or any, any of those pieces. Uh, or whether you maybe already got some best-in-class capability, you've already got a demand planning platform. Well, we'll just take that and use that. But the power comes when we start to collaborate intelligently and enable a different way of working. Planning by exception, driving exceptions and managing by metrics to help towards ensuring that the business stays on track and continues to improve the benefits that it's doing. Enabling planning decisions for different value levers and value drivers, both in the, all, all in the cloud, but driving that from a continuous alignment point of view. There's a few people we've helped. I'm not going to go through any of them. I just wanted to give you a bit of a flavour of many people that we've helped here. But I want to get to the homework here now. I want to get to the homework because, you know, around the world, I've had the privilege of talking to people right around the world. And here's my takeaways for you. My takeaways would be, and just let me give you a couple of them. Um, maybe you want to take a picture and take it as a bit of homework. But what kind of supply chain capabilities are you leveraging? 
If you've got capability, are you leveraging? Do you know where it is? And what can you do about it? In, in a world where we are trying to balance supply and demand, let me keep it really simple. If you can't balance supply and demand, then often we say, well, let's do overtime, let's just produce more. But there's a flip side to that coin that also says, what can we produce that we can't sell? And there's a big opportunity there. Here's the reality. If you can improve your forecast, it has a couple of impacts. Number one, if your forecast improvement, that means you have more of the right product in the right place at the right time, your revenue should go up. But here's the interesting piece that we often miss, is you also should have less of the wrong products in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that should mean it costs you less because there's less write-off, there's less, less storage costs, etc. What improvements can you make? Well, think about new product introduction. Lots of companies focus on new product introduction and portfolio management. What new products are we going to launch? And there's always a lot of focus around getting it right. But if you're going to launch products, what products are you going to kill? Which products need to be delisted? And here's just a little trick. This is mine, one of the things that I've helped people with. I said, okay, when you go to sales and say, which products are we going to delist? You have to go, oh, we can't delist it because that one's special. My customer needs that. <laughs> give them a couple of trump cards. Give the sales guys a couple of trump cards and say, you can play these trump cards, but we're still going to look at these 25 products that we want to delist. They'll play their trump card on the one they want to keep, but all, tw all 25 won't go. Some will be kept, but you're continuing to get rid of the fat in, in, in the portfolio. And then finally, are your plans both feasible and profitable? Hopefully that's something that's interested you. Please do feel free to follow me on, on LinkedIn, connect with us at board. Um, I'm happy. One of my favorite phrases is, please ask me, because if I can't help you, I know someone who can. Thank you very much.